Thank you for inviting me, and um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about what PGE is doing with renewable energy and what we see as some of the big costs out there uh, over time as we try to transition our society um, and our nation toward 100% renewable energy. Um, as a marketer, I, I'm always looking to, to capture information on what's going on out there in the market. So how many of the people here pay their power bills? Okay. There's a lot of folks that might be renters or students in a hall. Um, now, of those people, how many have signed up for their utilities renewable power program? That's great. That's great. Well, as a marketer for a renewable energy program, I want to thank you and start talking about what I do. Um, this is just a general outline of my talk. A um, little bit about, we'll start off with a little bit about what I do, um, where we are today. Um, the renewables that we talk, that we, we typically deal with here in Oregon, um, show you a quick shot of PGE system mix to kind of show you where, where, where we stand today and you know how far we have to go to move toward 100 percent. Then we'll talk about some of the, the costs and there's the transmission costs and there's the carbon costs and then there's the development costs associated with that kind of transition. So this is this is a general model of kind of what, what we do in the renewable power program at PGE is we market renewable energy to our customers. And we find ways to um, connect with customers all through a, a variety of different channels, whether it's over the web, um, using the radio, direct mail. Face-to-face um, -face is usually the, one of the more uh, successful for us. So we're out there talking to people about renewable energy and giving them the option to sign up if they're willing to pay a small premium. Um, we've done fairly well. We've been ranked uh, fairly high by the Renew National Renewable Energy Labs in uh, Golden, Colorado. And uh, we've, 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 I think, started moving the dial um, significantly toward uh, showing that, you know, this is a value to customers in the Pacific Northwest and that people are willing to pay a small, reasonable premium for renewables. Um, and we can see that that's, that's common throughout the, the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Power and Puget Sound Energy have programs that are fairly successful as well. Um, this is kind of where we started out back in 2001. Um, then we had uh, Senate Bill 1149 kick in, which was required both of the investor-owned utilities to offer renewables to their customers. We um, contracted with a third-party marketer, Green Mountain Energy, and today we stand at, uh, well, this is as of July, about 66,000 customers. Um, and on a national level, we have about 10% of all of the people in the country that are signed up for renewable energy. So we're really proud of our customers. Um, as defined by law, renewable sources uh, in Oregon typically are composed of wind, solar, geothermal, low-impact hydro, biomass. There are a couple of other small uh, additions to that, but those are really the, the prime time players out there today for renewable energy. Um, and um, as you can see, they all have their benefits, uh, primarily the low environmental impact, impacts, and that they don't really deplete nat uh, natural resources in Oregon. Um, Wind power is, is, is by far the biggest, as you heard earlier in the panels. Uh, it's the low-cost leader for utility-scale renewables out there, um, especially in, a, in an area like the Northwest where large, large hydro is not considered a renewable. Uh, there are regional differences. So if you go to other parts of the U.S., particularly east of the Mississippi, hydro is considered a renewable, but not out here. So. Uh, when we talk about renewables in, in the Northwest, we're talking about these, these essentially these newer technologies. And wind power, biomass um, is another uh, form of renewable energy that's been out, has a long history in, in the Northwest, primarily because of our, um, our timber, timber industries. And uh, one that I always thought was the most interesting was, uh, was biomass, um, using biogas, I should say, which is, in this case, um, uh, where you typically collect uh, livestock waste, in this case uh, cow manure, and uh, digest it um, and use the methane given off to drive uh, an internal combustion engine and essentially generate renewable energy as you destroy this very potent greenhouse gas called methane. So um, we have a small uh, biogas facility near Salem, Oregon, 
And we'd like to see more of them get built, but to be honest with you, the, the economics, getting the economics right is difficult. This is just a quick snapshot of uh, PGE's uh, mix. Um, and it's a snapshot. This changes over the, over the course of the year. Um, these, this is actually, uh, as you can see, it's over six years old. Um, and it's, but it's, it just gives you an idea that most people don't carry around with them, that we're not all hydro. I mean, there is a significant amount of thermal, thermal energy, uh, thermal sources used for the generation of electricity in Oregon. And if we were showing you a, a mix from Pacific Power, it would be even more. Uh, typically, they have a larger coal mix, a percentage of coal in their mix. This is this speaks to the carbon uh, of what the carbon aspects of what we've done. We we've, we've calculated that since we started offering renewable power to our customers, we've offset just about a billion pounds of CO2, um, and you know we're, we're fairly proud of that, and we think our customers should be too because they're the people that are make, paying that premium. So let's get into the cost issues. Um, transmission, I think, is really going to be the big issue here. I mean the the, the the, the, the reality of renewable resources is, is that they're typically located in fairly remote areas, um, unless you're talking about biomass. But the, the, big, the, the real big players here are wind um, and in, uh, concentrated solar power. Those are going to require the long distance movement of energy from the areas where the energy is produced to the load center where people actually use the energy. And I think that's going to be the trick here. For wind, it's going to be moving, in, especially in the Northwest, it's moving it from eastern parts of Oregon, eastern Wyoming, uh, well, not just Wyoming in general, Montana, um, eastern Washington, to load centers. That's always the big trick there. And, and while we've been able to piggyback on the transmission that was developed for the, the hydro systems in the Northwest, we're finding now that, that that's almost fully tapped out, and it's time to think about transmission for these renewables for their own sake. In other words, they shouldn't have to just piggyback onto existing transmission, but we need the opportunity to provide transmission for these renewable resources just um, as renewables. And there's, there's some tricks associated with that because um, most of the renewable generation sources I talk about here are, are intermittent, so they don't carry power 24-7 like uh, some of the hydro system transmissions, uh, transmission lines do. So um, there's a lot of costs associated with this, and there's a lot, not only uh, of financial costs, but societal costs, as we work to decide who's going to get these transmission lines sited on whose property. So there's obviously a lot of legal issues attached to that. Um, I'm a big believer in concentrated solar power. I think we'll see more of that in the years to come. That's going to require the moving uh, generation of energy. Uh, this, this is typically where you use, you concentrate the solar energy to drive a, a turbine. You use uh, a banks, you know, large banks of mirrors to heat steam or some other liquid, and it drives a turbine just like you would with a, with a, with a thermal combustion, um, and you drive that and you produce large amounts of, of energy, and there are even some emerging storage capabilities for uh, con concentrated solar power so that you can generate energy well into the evening after the sun goes down. But again, these are going to require the opportunity, or they're, they're going to require uh, large transmission investments to bring the energy out of the essentially the southwest portions of the U.S. to load centers on the coasts and um, in the north. And then um, we see the emergence just now, just the, 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 uh, the, the emergence of tidal and wave projects. And those are going to require, at least on the west coast, moving that energy from the east, uh, the coast, excuse me, on the west coast to the east where the load centers are. So there's significant costs attached to that. And, you know, this, the development of all of this new transmission capability is going to, is going to be taxing in, in more ways than one. Um, we were hearing about it earlier, you know, the, the, the true cost of carbon. Um, how carbon will impact the energy markets is going to make a significant impact on how quickly we make that move to 100 percent renewables. Um, I think, you know, clearly in the Northwest we're, 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 we're um, positioned fairly well because our, our, our energy mix is fairly low carbon. Even though renewables aren't considered 
um, even though, excuse me, large hydro isn't considered renewables, it's clearly a carbon-free source of energy. So I think we're, we're starting off in a better place than other parts of the country. But as, if we're trying to indeed look at the U.S. moving toward 100 percent renewables, there's going to be very uh, specific location impacts from the pricing carbon. And you're going to see people in the, particularly east of the Mississippi uh, see much higher impacts from any, any, any carbon pricing scenarios that, that are imposed. And um, my own view of, of uh, climate change, and I don't know, you know if it's shared by everybody here, is I think there's a, there's a nonlinear aspect of what, what we'll see in the years to come. So that we'll follow a traditional, um, you know, first would be something like a cap and trade program and then additional re uh, regulations to tighten up on carbon emissions. But I suspect we're going to see some nonlinear effects, and that's going to push um, our government to finding new sources and, and new new ways to regulate carbon, uh, very, probably very similar to what's going on in the economic markets today. It's a very nonlinear, um, there's, we're seeing some very nonlinear events. And then uh, the development costs. There's the, 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 the true, you know, these are going to have to be uh, in, in, incorporated in, in, in a way that we, we haven't seen other uh, generation costs incorporated into our society, whereas we, we're going to have to set aside money, tax revenues to, to, to uh, increase the effectiveness of wind, uh, excuse me, of, of tidal and wave generation. Um, we're going to have to set aside uh, tax dollars to perfecting the fuel supplies for biomass. You know, biomass is a, is, has a big potential, but one of the, one of the linchpins and one of the weak points is, is ensuring a, a steady fuel supply so that if you really build that thermal, that plant to generate biomass that you can you can guarantee that there's a fuel supply to that facility for 20 years and day in and day out and then there's uh, finally there's the uh, there's the, the this big uh, this big kahuna that you've pro probably heard about called the smart grid and once we have a smart grid the facilitation you'll see that facilitate renewable energy uh, more than, than any one technology, is, is once we can get to the point where machines know what, exactly when to use energy and how much energy to use, and we kind of pull humans as far back out of that loop as possible so that w it's, we're using efficient energy as efficiently as possible, um, then we'll see, you know, significant steps being, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll reduce our power, power needs and therefore allow renewables to step in to fill the gap. So as you can see, you know, this was pretty high level. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of the, the, the big costs that are out there. And um, I see them, you know, I'm, I'm daunted, to be honest with you, by the cost of the transmission um, and the smart grid costs and then all of the associated technology with that. And I'm concerned. I think today when you look at the economic news um, going on internationally, you're going to see, you, you'll see that there's been kind of a reconfiguration of priorities. And I'm concerned personally that, you know, carbon and, and or climate change are going to be pushed well down on the list of priorities because of the concerns around the financial market. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Oley. I'm an attorney at the uh, law firm of Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt in Portland. Uh, I've been asked to talk today about the legal challenges facing renewable resources. Uh, that's kind of an interesting topic because the more I thought about it, uh, the more I think that uh, there's more in the way of positive uh, aspects of legal issues going on right now than there are negative. Uh, I kind of lump the uh, challenges to renewable, uh, renewable power into three broad categories. The first is legal, which is really political. The second is financial, which we're seeing a lot of aspects in right now, and, and who knows what's going to happen in the financial markets. And the third is technical, and uh, you're probably going to hear a lot about the te technologies that are uh, being developed right now, and the fact that, that the technologies are not in the same place, either legally or financially. All three of these uh, particular challenges all interact, and you'll, you'll see at certain times is that uh, the law will 
be ahead of the financial community or uh, of the technical community or in many aspects the law will be following behind it. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, this being a law school, I decided that this uh, particular presentation wouldn't be uh, complete without a case study. And I uh, guarantee you that I will not be calling on anybody randomly here to talk about this. Uh, but the, this particular case demonstrates the uh, political nature of the legal challenges to renewable energy. And it is the recent decision in the uh, Oregon Public Utility Commission of In Ray Honeywell. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with what happened in that case, uh, but basically it was a challenge uh, by one of the major utilities, uh, who is not represented today on this panel, uh, to one of the more successful models for solar power. And that uh, model is where you have a public building and that public building owner partners with a private entity to build a solar array on the roof and turn around and sell power to the owner of the building and at the same time benefit from all of the tax credits, uh, the Oregon Energy Trust, uh, financial incentives, and whatever federal programs or other incentive programs that exist for private companies. Of course, a private entity doesn't pay any taxes. It can't benefit from that. Uh, what I know about the financial model of this particular type of, uh, of uh, facility is that it is very it is very tenuous. It, it's very balanced. One little tip in one direction in this type of uh, project is not going to be financially feasible. Uh, for reasons unknown, uh, a major utility challenged the ability of these third-party companies to qualify for the tax credits, uh, also questioned whether or not the customer, the public building owner, would be entitled to net metering, which is one of the legal uh, provisions uh, where a public utility is required to uh, install a meter which will run both directions uh, should somebody uh, install uh, renewable energy on their, on their site. Uh, and they also uh, argued that the third party provider of the solar array would be a public utility and therefore regulated by the Oregon Public Utility Commission, would have to file tariffs, would have to keep the books according to uh, the OPUC, and I can tell you that the regulatory processes there uh, would make this an unfeasible model if they were, in fact, considered to be sellers of electricity in the market. This particular case, and as I said, demonstrates the political nature of the law in this area. Uh, originally, I don't know if people are familiar with how the OPUC operates, but the OPUC has what's called staff, and staff are people that work at the PUC and who participate in many respects like a party, even though they are, uh, even though they are employees of the PUC. And there have been issues in the past about how, uh, whether or not the staff is biased, whether or not the staff has ex parte uh, contact with the commissioners and all the like. Uh, but that aside, staff originally filed their papers in this action saying that yes, uh, these third-party providers were regulated utilities and therefore subject to OPUC regulation. Uh, as you can expect, this caused great distress uh, because this is one of the types of facilities that is being strongly pushed by uh, politicians and activists alike. Uh, PGE supports this type of uh, facility and was in fact on the other side of this litigation saying that this, was, this should not be a regulated utility. Uh, but then again, staff is a bureaucratic type of uh, organization and therefore usually digs in its heels and rarely changes its mind. In this particular case, however, they did change their mind, which at least rarely to ever happens. And they eventually did agree that that should not be a regulated utility. And in fact, the OPUC's decision in this case came down basically fully supporting the position of the third party providers and the public building owners. And so what you see now is, is these types of projects will continue. And in fact, I just recently worked on a certain project like this, writing up the uh, what we call the power purchase agreement, which is the agreement between 
uh, the third party provider and the building owner. So I think we're going to see a lot more of this type of model, especially when you have the legal challenges uh, being dealt with and you have the organizations which can uh, ultimately make these decisions under significant pressure to promote this type of, um, this type of activity. What I want to do now is kind of briefly give you an overview of a lot of the challenges that I see in terms of developing renewable energy projects. And, and just a little bit about my background, uh, I started in the, um, uh, in the energy, legal energy business. I went out uh, after burning out of uh, the private practice for a while. Uh, I went out to the island of Saipan, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, answered one of those ads in the back of the bar bulletin. Uh, ended up being the government lawyer for the utility on the island, uh, you know, serving both well, well, water, power, and sewer. Uh, and there you have a situation of an isolated system with whole bunches of problems. Uh, but that got my feet wet into utility law. I then came out back uh, to the Northwest and uh, have been involved in a, in a number of utility projects. I, I am in most regards a litigator, and so a lot of times I look at uh, some of the problems that, are, uh, that exist in, in that regard. Uh, but now, let's get into it. Uh, regarding federal laws, uh, we touched on it in uh, earlier panel, uh, one of the big uh, motivators for uh, renewable energy and the federal laws, the production tax credit. And I'm sure many of you are aware of that, basically two cents per kilowatt hour tax credit. The big problem with this law, it's on again, off again. And when I wrote up my outline for today's speech, we didn't know if it was on again because it was going to expire at the end of 2008. But it was put into the, uh, one of the, uh, <laughs> one of, one of the uh, uh, extra add-ons to the bailout bill. And so they've given it another year through the end of 2009 for the production tax credit. Uh, this, although applies to a, a number of uh, different types of facilities, is especially evident in the wind power uh, ty type of facilities. And just to give you an example of what happens when you have the production tax credit and when you don't, uh, in 1999 there was a production tax credit. This is when wind really started to take off. And you saw uh, 575 megawatts come online. 2000, the uh, PTC expired. You had 43 megawatts come online. 2001, they re-upped it. You had uh, 1,600 megawatts come online. 2002, it was off again, 410 megawatts. Uh, on again, off again, all the way up to, well, 2007, it was on again, and uh, we have 5,200 megawatts of, of wind coming online. So this particular type of program is extremely effective, at least at the present time, uh, to promote the development of renewable resources. The problem, of course, is it's dependent upon the political nature, and what needs to happen is it needs to be stabilized, needs to be passed for a long-term period of time uh, in order to be completely effective. Uh, the other uh, issue with the production tax credit that needs to be addressed is that as technologies mature, uh, and, and this came up in a, a panel that I was on a couple of weeks ago regarding ocean energy, and where one of the uh, financial uh, gurus on that panel noted that it's going to take some real political will to move the production tax credit down the technology line when the particular technologies mature and become cost effective without it. And I don't know the particular numbers right now, but wind is getting pretty close to being uh, cost effective without, well, without the production tax credit. It's not there yet, obviously, but it will get there. Wind is ahead of everything else right now. Solar energy is coming up next behind it. And then, uh, as we learned in this panel that I was on, uh, the uh, wave energy is still in the experimental phase. In fact, so the uh, even the high-risk investment right now is not looking at putting money into wave energy simply because it's still at the development stage. And uh, there's not even the, the necessary 25 percent uh, or plus returns that they uh, need in order for those kind of projects. Moving along with other federal uh, regulations, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a lot of involvement in the uh, 
development of renewable resources. Uh, first, going back to this wave energy issue, uh, amazingly, if you have a wave project that's within three miles of the coastline, it falls under FERC jurisdiction and it falls under their hydro licensing rules, which were designed for the development of the big dams. And these are basically 50-year licenses and it takes years to get them. As you can think, that doesn't really jive with the wave technology type of uh, project. And FERC has been moving along with trying to streamline the process. They have entered into a memorandum of understanding with the state of Oregon, uh, for instance, where they are looking to streamline the process, especially right now, where you have a situation, you're not looking at commercial development, you're simply looking at the uh, experimental projects which are going in, they still need permits. Uh, and uh, Oregon State University has its program. Uh, there are a number of private companies which are still in the technological, uh, technologically developing this type of, of project. Uh, but they are still looking to get their, uh, these provisional licenses that they need to, to drive their projects. Uh, traditionally, there are two types of other FERC licenses for uh, any kind of project. Uh, well, one type of project for any type of generator is called an exempt wholesale generator. And this came about as part of the market deregulation rules. And what they wanted to do was allow uh, private parties to develop just standalone generation facilities, uh, but still then be able to uh, sell their power into a market, not necessarily be owned by a utility or not necessarily be uh, tied to any one customer. So FERC came up with the rules of what's called the exempt wholesale generator. Uh, and in order to qualify for that, you have to file your proper applications, your market uh, tariff applications. Uh, that basically allows you to sell power into the market at market rates. But at the same time, you have to demonstrate that you don't have market power. Uh, FERC was not very successful at uh, weeding out these <laughs> companies that did not have market power in uh, 2000 and 2001, where you had a number of exempt wholesale generators basically driving the market. Uh, they have, after that point in time, uh, tightened up their rules. Uh, there are affiliate rules. There are. Um, uh, certain other rules which deal with how you can operate as an exempt wholesale generator. I haven't seen this particular issue become a problem in any of the renewable resource projects, uh, especially recently where you've got, uh, again, a political will to license these facilities, get them online, and you do not seem to have companies where or, or situations where you would have a renewable facility or an owner of a renewable facility that could uh, affect markets that would prohibit them from being licensed. Uh, the other type of federal facility that there is is what's called a QF, or a qualified facility. And the benefit of a QF is that you are able to actually lead your, the public utilities in which your facility sits must legally buy the power that you generate for their avoided cost. And there are certain, uh, a number of rules regarding what qualifies as a qualified facility. Usually they're small. Uh, less than 30 megawatts, uh, and they have to be developed from certain resources such as wind, solar, geothermal. Uh, I've, back in 2000, 2001, I worked on licensing a number of uh, QFs uh, based on, uh, basically they were starting up old bark burners in a lot of the mills because the price of power was so high, they were able to start up these old steam facilities and actually make money. Uh, other uh, federal laws, I'll, I'll just mention NEPA. If you've got a federal, federal decision uh, or federal citing decision on something, you're going to have to uh, uh, comply with the uh, federal environmental regulations. I want to jump now to really what I call the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room out here in the Pacific Northwest. And I see it, Jason's here. And that's uh, the Bonneville Power Administration. Because when you're talking about the law, and you're talking about the legal uh, impediments or the legal promotions of renewable energy resources, the real key uh, to getting those things online and up and running uh, so far in the Pacific Northwest has been the cooperation of the Bonneville Power Administration. This is uh, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, they're, they're the biggest game in town, and they own most of the transmission. You heard that there's an issue about transmission. One of the big bottlenecks of transmission is right down the Columbia Gorge. 
from the east side of the Columbia Gorge, the Dalles Dam, McNary Dam, over to the Portland area, up to Seattle, up down to California. And it's, uh, it's BPA that uses its authority over the majority of transmission to redistribute transmission uh, to balance and control the authorities uh, or the, the, the technology of the transmission system in order to allow the integration of renewable resources. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the keys there uh, has been BPA's willingness to what it was allowed to do balancing charges and uh, integration of wind. One of the unique properties of wind is that it fluctuates. One, one you can't even really tell uh, a day ahead what the wind is going to be like. They're getting better at predicting it, but it not only fluctuates day to day; it fluctuates hour to hour, and it fluctuates minute to minute. The traditional power market sells power on hour blocks. So the hour before, you go in and you, you assure your customer that you're going to give them, say, 50 megawatts of flat power. So everybody knows going in an hour ahead how much power is going to be available and how it's going to be sold. But when you have wind power, you have within hour fluctuations. And somebody's got to deal with this. And it's falling upon the uh, control authority in which the facility is sited. Or, and this becomes very technical in terms of how you keep the transmission system running. Uh, somebody has to be on top of it every minute in case there are fluctuations in load, in case there are fluctuations in generation. And this is what Bonneville has done. They have, that they, with their hydro resources, are able to scale up their generation should there be a drop in the wind or, in fact, drop their generation, store energy behind the dams in the form of water if the wind is blowing. And just recently, uh, Bonneville has instituted a uh, what they call a wind integration balancing charge to pay for these within-hour fluctuations. And that's uh, right now stands at 68 cents per installed kilowatt hour or installed kilowatt of the uh, facility inside Bonneville's control uh, authority. What I have heard from the market is, of course, this is somewhat undervalued. Uh, there's a concern that this is going to uh, do nothing but increase and could become a problem in the ability of wind resources uh, and increasing wind resources to afford to integrate into the facility it's, it's, or into the uh, transmission system. It, it is something that is going to take, uh, again, a political will to structure uh, Bonneville's priorities in order to support the integration of renewable resources. Uh, quickly, the, uh, the Bonneville Power Administration is governed primarily by what's called the Northwest Power Act. That was passed in 1980. And it sets a whole series of priorities, sets up a whole series of processes in order to uh, for BPA to, to set its uh, priorities. One of the priorities is, by statute, renewable resources. But there is a great deal of discretion. And there are a ton of uh, competing resources or competing interests in those resources. You think about the water behind the dam. You have flow requirements for fish. You have BPA's own requi revenue requirements uh, for generation. You have irrigation issues. And you have navigation issues all competing for the same for the same water. Uh, I have heard of one instance in the middle of the night in March last year where uh, the wind was howling, there was a ton of water in the system, and BPA was calling the wind facilities to shut down because they simply did have no, they had no other way of redistributing, uh, redispatching their system. They had to make the flow requirements that they were required for fish, and uh, they were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, just quickly here to go to um, some of the some of the other well uh, some of these other people have touched on the fact that you're going to have uh, greenhouse gas uh, em emission issues competing with uh, or driving certain technologies uh, for renewable resources. Uh, that's another easily be a, a federal issue. Uh, and of course, we have a whole slew of state laws, OPUC regulation, uh, and again, I've mentioned Oregon Energy Trust. I'd like to end up with uh, the, the ability of local authorities uh, to, in a way, promote 
renewable resources. And one of the ways that we've that we're starting to see this, and you might be uh, have heard of the uh, the LEED uh, certification program for buildings, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. Uh, I end up representing a fair number of architects and engineers throughout the kind of technical practice that I have. And uh, in terms of designing buildings to be extremely energy efficient and to, uh, in fact, go through this process where they get a certificate and, uh, and uh, it's called a LEED certificate, what you're going to see currently right now, the city of Portland has certain, I think I believe it's a silver certificate required for all of its buildings or new construction. I think you're going to see that go up. There has been talk uh, in the future where you're going to see uh, the LEED certification or uh, something similar built into the local building codes where every building that's built is going to have to meet certain energy efficiency standards uh, or include uh, passive or active renewable resources in the structure itself. Uh, so that, that is a, a place where you're going to see local uh, authorities have the ability to impact the uh, ability uh, or the uh, development of renewable resources. Thank you. Hello, uh, yes, I'm Peter Dorman, and uh, I have to say that I feel a little bit strange talking on this subject, which is now uh, only my second most urgent uh, crisis topic uh, of the moment. Um, uh, but in fact, um, there actually are interesting uh, connections between uh, climate change and the current uh, financial chaos. Uh, another topic that I, I sometimes give a talk on is the implication, implication of, a, um, of a rigorous uh, program to uh, forestall catastrophic climate change on uh, the capital stock and the, uh, the prices uh, of the capital stock in, in the United States. Uh, for instance, fairly substantial changes in housing values will be associated with the kinds of energy price increases that we will have to impose on ourselves in order to meet the uh, carbon targets that we set. And uh, if maybe you haven't noticed, but housing price uh, changes can have a big impact on the financial system. Um, <laughs> so that would be a, an interesting topic to explore, but uh, that is not the topic for today. Actually, what I'm going to do is revisit a lot of the issues from the first panel. Um, I'm not really going to address the kinds of things that the rest of uh, my co-panelists in the second panel have brought up, but really uh, cycle back to the issues in the first panel, but maybe with a somewhat different perspective on it. Um, just to say, uh, before I get into the, the, uh, the structure of my talk, where this came from was my work with uh, the Sightline Institute on the Western Climate Initiative. And I went into it as a naive academic, thinking that uh, one could provide uh, intelligent and evidence-based policy advice, and it would have some influence because of the intensity of the economic interests at stake in the WCI process. None of what I said made any difference at all. And so I thought maybe I should devote a little bit of time and attention to understanding the political economic dimension, that is, the way the economic states interact with the policy process uh, in order to um, uh, forewarn uh, us all about the way these uh, concerns will arise when we move to the federal level next year, as we probably will. So here's the sum to forestall climate change uh, will require really massive <coughs> economic changes, really quite substantial in, in physical terms, if you will. Uh, and this will also be reflected in, uh, in price changes. These price changes will result in huge winners and losers. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars annually will be at stake uh, in this game. Uh, so the interests are really quite large. Um, now, on the, on the one hand, it is possible, I think, to de design rational 
uh, and evidence-based policies that can do a good job of meeting the targets we set for ourselves at relatively low uh, economic cost. And I will say a little bit more about uh, how that, that can be done. However, I think that we are unlikely, at least at, at the, as the way things currently stand, to move in such a direction because the process will probably be hijacked by interests that have so much at stake. Uh, and I will try to describe what I think the policies will be that they will promote. Uh, and also the kind of confusion that they will sow in the minds of the public about what a cost of, of, of dealing with climate change is in the first place. Uh, and I think we've already seen this in the Western Climate Initiative, unfortunately. Uh, and maybe we'll have an interesting interchange with the, the representative who uh, will speak to us from WCI this afternoon. So let me get on to some of the details of this. Uh, what does a rational program look like? Uh, the centerpiece of such a program uh, will, be, um, the, will be a cap and trade system. Uh, now I say this, uh, um, or, or would be a cap and trade system. I, I could give an entire talk on why a cap and trade system is to be preferred over a carbon tax. I know that uh, the sentiment on the first panel was somewhat different. Uh, Without getting into much detail, I will say uh, just two things very quickly. The first is that um, a large percentage of economists favor a carbon tax because they don't like taxes on earned income and capital gains. They think this is terribly distorting and holds back economic growth. And they would much prefer to see a sales tax finance uh, uh, government at all levels. Uh, and that, that would include all the conservative names that you saw on that previous slide. Uh, and they are delighted with the idea of a carbon tax because it's a sales tax. Uh, and so the technical name for this is double dividend. If you Google double dividend and carbon tax, uh, you, what you will find are a large number of articles that talk about how much, what a spurt in economic growth we're going to get when we finally eliminate the IRS and we eliminate the capital gains tax. Now, I personally think this is bonkers, and it's, uh, there's no evidence whatever to support it, but a very significant percentage of the economics profession thinks this way. Uh, and because they think this way, they're for a carbon tax. They're for it because it's a sales tax. Uh, my, my statement to you is, if you go along with this, you don't have to wait for federal carbon policy. You can eliminate your existing tax system in Oregon and replace it with a sales tax like we have in Washington State and bask in its glory. Um, <laughs> however, um, I don't think personally that this is, is, a, is a good uh, direction to move in uh, nationally. Uh, and the second reason why a, a, a cap is preferable is that uh, the relationship between prices and quantities is very murky. Uh, we don't even really know what the elasticity of demand, short run, medium run, long run, is going to be for our carbon intensive fuels. So there will be a lot of uncertainty about the relationship between prices and quantities. And we can, put, we can load that uncertainty either on prices, which is what a, a cap does, that is a cap sets a, a physical target and then the prices fluctuate, or we can load the uncertainty on carbon. We can have a definite price and then the carbon fluctuates. And so it just depends on what you're more worried about. If you're more worried about not knowing what the price of fuels will be next year, then of course you're for a tax. And if you're much more worried, as I am, about the possibility of uh, positive feedback loops inaugurating uh, some sort of catastrophic climate change, then uh, you really want to set a cap and, and achieve that cap. So that's, that's in a nutshell, and there's much more to be said, but in a nutshell that's the case for, for cap and trade. Now, a good program would be comprehensive and upstream. By upstream, I mean it would, uh, cap, it would cap the introduction of carbon fuels into the economy. It would cap the sources of carbon and not the uses of carbon. So it would go right to the source. It would cap it at that level, and then it would leave it to the price system to determine what the best uses of the limited carbon would be. That would be a rational system and it would be the most e economically efficient system. Um, also to have minimum loopholes, because the loopholes interfere with the, uh, the benefits of allowing the, uh, the trading system, the price system to operate. Uh, the permits would be auctioned under such a system, I'll say more about that shortly, uh, and, they, and the uh, revenue uh, would be recycled. 
uh, that would also be um, a, a rational approach. And I'll say more about that also shortly. Um, and then you would have to have supplemental programs in addition to that, mainly to increase the elasticity of demand uh, for, uh, for, for um, uh, uh, associated with, um, with the price effect. That is, uh, at the present time, demand for, for energy is, uh, appears to be very price inelastic. Um, the, the estimates range, um, so 0.5 is what people say, maybe mostly I think because it's, it's a round number. And we really have to get that elasticity up if we're going to avoid big price spikes. And the way you change the elasticity is by all these other programs uh, for research and development to new energy systems, to build infrastructure like the smart grid we've been listening about, listening to mass transit, uh, uh, regulation which can uh, sometimes overcome uh, institutional bottlenecks that prevent uh, good things from happening, uh, and, and border taxes which were referred to uh, in the first panel so that we uh, deal with the problem of uh, unequal international trade if some countries move more uh, rapidly on climate change than others. So it's, one can describe in general what, um, what a rational program would look like. Uh, let me say a, a little bit more about why revenue uh, recycling is important because it's an issue which um, I think there's a lot of confusion on this issue. Again, a tax on carbon is a, is a sales tax. And cap and trade is effectively a tax on carbon also. It's a different system for setting up a tax, but there will be a price on, on carbon. And the money will come from your pocket and my pocket whenever we buy anything that is produced with a, with a carbon fuel or transported with a carbon fuel, so on. Now, as a sales tax, a national sales tax, that will have, um, First of all, macroeconomic uh, consequences. It's, it's uh, like any big tax increase, it, uh, it, uh, um, it, it moves against economic growth, and so you have to uh, offset that in some way. There are distributional considerations. Uh, uh, sales taxes are regressive, and I'll give you some data on that shortly. Uh, and finally, uh, I think you really do have to protect households from the consequences of really dramatic run-ups in energy prices um, if you want to minimize hardship and also if you want to ensure that the policies that we enact will, will be sustainable over the long term. Uh, dealing with, with climate change is a multi-generational commitment. We're talking about committing ourselves to something that will have to continue through our grandchildren and beyond. So with the ups and downs of political cycles, somehow this program has to be a third rail. It has to be untouchable um, in politics. And the only way you can do that is by minimizing the cost on, on households. If households perceive that they're suffering from this thing, then it, it will be inevitable that sooner or later they will rebel against it and, and they will disrupt the, the policy process. So, here is uh, one simulation, the best simulation I know of, of the uh, the household impact of the kinds of energy prices we're looking at. And the, the exact numbers don't mean so much because uh, we're really only guessing at how much, um, how much uh, money will, is at stake, but it's the pattern that, that matters. And what you see here is that um, if, you, if you have a, a price on carbon, a substantial price on carbon, and, um, and you don't recycle the revenue at all, uh, it's, it's purely regressive, and uh, the impact, and it's the, these ratios that are really important, the impact on the bottom quintile of the, of the population is about twice as much in, as percentage of its income as on the top quintile. Uh, and that's a big problem. But if you recycle the money, uh, equal shares to each household, then it's exactly the opposite. And in fact, it's a, it's a major progressive income redistribution uh, from the top of the pyramid down to the bottom. Um, so a lot of money is at stake and it really is important to do it right. Now, where will the political economic pressures come from? What are the choke points here uh, where you're likely to see what economists call rent seeking? Uh, 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 political interference on the part of special interests 
to uh, reduce the efficiency of the program for their own personal gain. Of course, some of this will be around the targets for the cap itself. I part company with a lot of environmentalists. I'm actually not so worried about what the caps we set today. I really don't care whether the cap for 2050 is 80 percent reduction, 70 percent, 60 percent, 90 percent. 2050 is a long way off. We're going to be adjusting the cap every few years anyway. The really important thing is to set up a good system so that when we adjust the cap, whichever way we do it, we are doing it in a system that is rational, uh, that, that achieves its goals at minimum economic cost and has uh, relatively beneficial distributive effects uh, on, on households. So let's look at some of these things. The scope of the cap is, is extremely important. Um, and this is primarily related to the issue of upstream versus downstream capping or capping sources versus capping uses. What you, it's very much in the interest of, uh, of, of businesses, uh, particular sectors of the economy, to say, well, yes, we understand why you need a cap, but not us, right? We're important for national defense. We're really important for jobs. We're very important for X, Y, Z, whatever it is they're important for. They should not have to have these permits, these carbon permits. Um, and so what you end up with then is once you start capping sector by sector is differential permit budgets. And that becomes an area where people can bear down and try to get the best possible deal for their sector. Uh, another area is in loopholes. Um, and the one that I would really point to here is offsets. There's, there are others that uh, we could talk about if you're interested, uh, so-called off-ramps and, and price ceilings. But offsets in particular are important loopholes. Uh, and uh, the problem here is that offsets are very lucrative in two different ways. First of all, if you can uh, purchase an offset in lieu of a permit, and the offset is much cheaper, of course, you save a lot of money. But also, there's a whole offset industry which is created. That is to say, people package these offsets. They, uh, the people whose, whose uh, programs in, the, in whatever jurisdiction the offset applies to, uh, the programs that, are, that qualify for these offsets are now being subsidized. So a great deal of money is at stake on the part of the industries that, that are involved in, in these offsets. And uh, two reports have been issued in recent months on the premier global offset mechanism, the clean development mechanism that's run by the World Bank, which shows that um, uh, there's nothing there, that there really is no, that, that there, there are no real standards and uh, the system has been gamed up and down. Um, uh, so, so it happened. Uh, it happened even at the, in the best of the systems, and I imagine in, in the others it's even worse. Um, a very important issue is the percentage of the permits to be auctioned. Very important to understand is that price, the price of the permit will be passed along to consumers, whether it's given out for free or whether it's auctioned. And it's very simple to understand this, by the way. The point of a cap is to limit the amount of carbon which we emit as a result of our consumption, which means that our consumption has to adjust of things that have carbon in them. How will it adjust? It will adjust through the price mechanism. The price will go up and people will buy less. The prices will go up. That's the only way the system can work. Now the question is when we pay extra money for all the things that have carbon in them, where will that money go? Well, if, there, if the permits are given away for free, the money will stay with those who sold it. It will take the form of increased profits. If you, if you auction the permits, the money comes back to the public. You close that loop. The money has the potential for being recycled. So this is why it's important to auction the permits. Um, uh, of course, uh, the businesses will all have reasons for why they, the permits should not be auctioned, and they will apply, apply tremendous pressure. There's no rational economic argument for anything less than 100% auction. Repeat, no rational economic argument for anything less than 100% auction. If you see less than 100% auction, you know that rationality and public deliberation is not driving the process. It's a different type of, of process that's, that's taking place. 
The final question is, so what are you going to do with all this money if you auction the permits? You're going to have hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Uh, and that's, of course, another area where uh, the, the trough can be laid out for the interests that line up to, to feed on it. Um, it seems to me that the, the it's very well, I'll, I'll get to this in a moment in more detail, but the short version of this is one of the reasons for recycling this money back to households is precisely to avoid the free-for-all that you will otherwise see uh, of various interests that will use uh, less than honest arguments for why they should have uh, free money. So let's look at how the Western Climate Initiative has evolved. My take on WCI is that it is not so important as a program in itself uh, because it's going to be superseded within a year or two by, by a, a federal program, no matter who is elected uh, in November. But it is extremely important as a dry run or as a dress rehearsal for this national process. This is the closest thing we have to an actual rehearsal for what we're going to see at the federal, at the federal level uh, in Washington. Um, now, the process itself uh, was dominated for the most part by, quote unquote, stakeholders who turned out to be uh, the, in the various most affected uh, business interests. So utilities, uh, major energy consumers uh, and, uh, uh, of, of, of industry, um, uh, of course, uh, energy companies. Um, there's a list of, of these different sectors, all became extremely engaged in the process uh, and made lots of disingenuous arguments uh, to cover uh, for why they wanted their uh, interests to be upheld. Uh, and the process itself had a, had a kind of uh, maybe one meter of transparency, but below that was completely opaque. So for instance, I worked in the economic uh, analysis part of it, and I can tell you the entire economic analysis engine that WCI used was proprietary and unrevealed. We could never find out what the model was, what the assumptions in the model were, nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was completely opaque. There wasn't a pretense of transparency in it. Uh, and the result of this process, which was uh, dominated by uh, self-interested stakeholders and, uh, and uh, a lack of transparency, was uh, exactly the opposite of what a, a rational system would look like. You had separate permit budgets for each sector uh, rather than, than an upstream system, uh, which minimizes, of course, the advantage of having a price-based system in the first place. Uh, the most telltale sign, I think, is, is, is what they did with auctions. Uh, there's a minimum of 10% auctions, and I think the minimum is going to be like the ceiling in this thing. A, a minimum of 10% auctions uh, for the inauguration of the system uh, in 2013, and that goes up to 25% uh, by 2020. 2020, by the way, is not a real year. I hope you understand that. 2020 is a marker. It's not a real year. Long before 2020, we'll make other decisions about 2020. When people say something's going to happen in 2020, that just means we're not going to deal with it. Uh, so I, you probably already know that, but I would double underline that. So what we have is 10 percent, 10 percent uh, guaranteed auctions. Uh, so as much as 90 percent of the permits to be given away for free. Uh, wide, wide discretion in what to do with the limited auction money available. And um, well, some of the things that they have very broad categories of, of where the money is, is to go. Things like, and this is a direct quote, Promoting economic efficiency. Right? I can see that they've really got their hand very tightly on the, 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 uh, the system. When they, yes. Um, and finally, offsets uh, up to half. Up to half of all the permits can be offset. Uh, and only one vehicle is mentioned for these offsets. And guess what? It's the clean development mechanism, uh, which has. Uh, had just recently been discredited. So what I, what I see when I put this all together is that we had a dismal process and a dismal product. This scares me because I don't see any reason at the moment to think it's going to be any better when these issues are debated at the federal level. 
What I would advocate to you uh, is the following. We have to be careful. Oh, let me, before I, I'm running, taking too much time here. Right? There's one point I didn't make that I think is really important to make. The argument will be made over and over again that the price of, of carbon and the, the amount of, uh, of money that changes hands as a result of a cap and trade mechanism is the cost of the system. But it's not. It's not the cost of the system. The economic cost of the system is the cost in economic growth, i.e. production of real goods and services, attributable to instituting the system. The price changes and the money that changes hands, that's a transfer. That's what economists would call a transfer. We have a great deal of evidence, which I can go into if, there, if there's interest in this, that there are vast unutilized opportunities for energy efficiency in our economy. McKinsey estimates that we can achieve our carbon goals up to 2030 at no net economic cost. But that doesn't mean that there won't be hundreds of billions of dollars changing hands. There will be vast transfers of income associated with such a policy but no net economic cost. I'm saying this because I think people are going to uh, systematically try to tell you a different story uh, in the future. They will use terms uh, to confuse you. Uh, say the, pro the, pr the program is extremely costly and during a period of economic decline in the financial markets and so on, how can we afford such a program? Look, they're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars in carbon taxes or and so on. That's the confusion. You have to be clear-headed about that and not get confused. Beyond this, uh, I would say that we should anticipate a strong effort to hijack the process when it emerges in Washington. It would be very nice if we had some sort of public counterweight to this. Unfortunately, we don't have any such uh, organization uh, in the United States that can, that can uh, uh, fulfill that role at the moment. I wish we did. The final message to leave you with is that, uh, in my view, good policy is good process. Uh, the, the bottom line is take the money off the table. At every point in the system, try to remove the money which would be available to special interests that would go after it. So that means you cap upstream rather than having different uh, permit budgets for different sectors. It means you minimize offsets and, and other loopholes. You auction the permits and you have a program of recycling the income back to households uh, with just the smallest little piece of it uh, for, for, um, for other types of things. And if you want, and, and the supplemental programs I described should be financed the way any uh, government program is out of uh, the general tax revenue, not out of a national sales tax.